Good to see you again, Lynn. After the Taliban returned to power, they announced a total ban on the production of poppies, which of course is the source of opium. But this certainly wasn't a signal they were getting out of the drug business. Hi, Bev. No, it wasn't. Uh, the announcement by the Taliban's supreme leader that they were going to stop growing poppy was really just a signal to growers and drug lords uh, that uh, the time was coming when they wouldn't be allowed to grow poppy anymore, uh, to consolidate uh, what they had and to um, get into the business of producing methamphetamine. Now, the Taliban had already been doing that for some years and the the reason that we know that is because people who are involved in counter narcotics uh, agencies like the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime had been detecting what they call starter packs turning up in markets for made in Afghanistan heroin for some years before the collapse in uh, 2021 of the Afghan Republic. So uh, what they told me is um, if you're a big time heroin dealer in somewhere like Indonesia, uh, Japan, uh, Sri Lanka, Somalia, Kenya um, or Australia, um, and you took a delivery of, let's say, 100 kilograms of heroin, you would also be sent a five kilogram what they call starter pack so that you could start distributing that and uh, get your market underway. And that's what they did. So probably about five years before the 2021 collapse, the Taliban had started seeding their markets for meth. Yeah. And I guess the key thing that you've pointed out in, in the, the work that you've done here is it is significantly more profitable. Oh, exponentially, it seems. Um, on the streets of Perth a couple of years ago, you could get a kilogram of, of uh, Taliban heroin uh, for about 250000 uh, US dollars. And the same amount of mess was worth $700,000. So very, very much more um, expensive and therefore a greater return for the Taliban. But key to that is that you don't grow poppy. So you don't need the farmers. You don't need need the inputs that the farmers need to receive, like seed, fertiliser, all of that sort of stuff. The farmers were also receiving cash advances and it's a very um, labour intensive process. You get a, a poppy bulb, uh, you score it with a knife, you scrape out the opium as it oozes out of the poppy bulb and then you have to store that. Uh, so now with meth, you don't need that uh, all that labour. Uh, the farmers are now unemployed. Uh, meth is very much uh, easier and cheaper and um, less labour intensive to produce. Uh, so it's a disaster all round. What does that meant, the sort of exponential increase in, in the finances, the financial sort of boom of that for their power base and, of course, the various alliances they have with terror networks in the region? Oh, well, indeed. I think this is what's key, Bev. Uh, the Taliban, since they took over, have essentially transformed Afghanistan into a geographical holding pen, if you like, for about two dozen terrorists, listed terrorist groups and jihadist organisations that are directly threatening uh, states around them, including Pakistan, China, Russia, uh, Iran, uh, Tajikistan specifically, the Central Asian states, and, of course, the West, because that's what the ideology is all about. Um, now, Al-Qaeda um, is very much enmeshed with the Taliban and has been uh, for 20, 25 years. Um, Al-Qaeda operatives and high-level um, figures are now embedded in the administration of the Taliban in Kabul and in Kandahar, where the Supreme Leader is based. They're also involved in, um, again, uh, training camps. Jihadists are com coming from all over the world, from Libya, uh, Mozambique, Somalia, as I said, the Middle East, uh, to be trained at Al-Qaeda-run uh, militant camps in Afghanistan. And the um, Al-Qaeda are also taking a cut of money from earned from drugs, whether it's heroin, because there are still enormous stockpiles of raw opium, which aren't discussed when, when the um, swap from heroin to meth comes up, um, and uh, from illegal mining, gold, coal, copper, um, lithium, you name it. Um, so uh, the Taliban are making an enormous amount of money still. They always were. Um, they have those very well established smuggling routes worldwide because they were responsible for um, uh, 
98%, let's say, 90 to 95% of the heroin, uh, illegal heroin in markets worldwide, and um, and now meth. Uh, so this um, transforms Afghanistan into a very serious security threat, not only for Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, neighbouring countries, China, but for the rest of the world. And as one uh, counter-narcotics agent who was working with the Republic government in Kabul before the collapse of, um, of the Republic told me this is a coming catastrophe. The Taliban's stranglehold on mess production is a coming catastrophe for the world, he yeah. said. And sort of, and, and what's interesting too, Lynn, is of course none of this money is going to the Afghan population. Um, they are still getting big handouts, um, aid handouts, and a lot of countries are normalising relationships with this leadership. Well, yes, they are. You're absolutely right. It's um, basically um, a capture by a terrorist organisation. The first groups to congratulate the Taliban on their return were um, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, um, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, who was very sympathetic to their ideology. Um, and they have just entrenched their, um, their power uh, through um, basically money and mining. China China, as we know, is voraciously hungry for uh, natural resources. Afghanistan has them undeveloped. And China's um, relationship with the Taliban goes back decades. And now they're putting money in, um, fi basically financing uh, the Taliban's uh, hold on power um, by trying to get um, a grip on some of the uh, natural resources assets. But you've also got anti-Western regimes like Iran, like Russia. Um, and others that have um, even Turkey, Japan has an ambassador there, um, have uh, relationships with uh, with the Taliban on a diplomatic level, even though they haven't recognised them as legitimate. And even India, I was um, uh, talking with in Indian diplomats last week, they're at a loss as to what to do other than engage with the Taliban. And the best way to do that is diplomatically, and that gives the Taliban a sense of legitimacy. Yeah, extraordinary. A uh, big challenge for Australia, of course, too, because as the third biggest sort of consumer, this is a, a challenge for our narcotics um, agencies. And, and then we're feeding this, this sort of almost terror network. Well, I think that that's what's not understood, Bev, um, that you might think you're having a party and that it's fun, but every time the drugs come out, whether it's a line of cocaine at the book club meeting or um, MDMA at a rave, as in Melbourne, um, over the summer, um, what you're actually doing is not just having a good time, you are funding the Taliban's grip on power. They, um, as you know, um, uh, they're, they've repurposed their smuggling networks for guns, for explosives. They have uh, very close relationships with terror networks across the world. Al-Qaeda is using the money that they're getting through their relationship with the Taliban, um, uh, with Al-Shabaab, um, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in, in wherever it may be, right across Africa in the Middle East. And... Um, uh, uh, women are not allowed um, outside of their homes or to work. Um, boys are going to madrasas where they are taught how to count using bullets. Um, what we're doing by having a party with um, what we think is a fun drug, a party drug, is helping the Taliban maintain and tighten their grip on power. A sobering um, realisation. Good as always. Great work, Lynn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bev.